provided the pilot with valuable radar and target tracking information. The pilot's role was to get the aircraft as close as possible to its prey. Because the F-4 was designed around another revolutionary concept, it had no guns, only radar-aimed missiles. The Phantom not only proved a successful aircraft for the Navy and the Marine Corps, but was also adopted by the Air Force for a variety of fighter, reconnaissance, and ground attack roles in Vietnam. With its Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles, the F-4 was often successful against enemy MiGs, but it had to be upgraded with a cannon for close encounters with the lighter Russian-made fighters, which were more agile and hence extremely dangerous. Intelligence data gathered on the improvements to Soviet cruise missiles and their launch from aircraft, ships and submarines continued to worry U.S. naval strategists. They knew from their own experiments the devastating effect this new type of weapon could have and asked the obvious question, could an anti-missile weapon be developed? Hughes Weapons Division thought so. They offered the AIM-54 Phoenix missile which, although having the disadvantage of being large and heavy, could lock on to another missile at a range of 50 miles. The problem now was to find an aircraft that could carry the Phoenix and still fly fast over long distances. For some time, just such an aircraft had been contemplated by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in a project named TFX, or Tactical Fighter Experimental. Later designated F-111, two versions had been contemplated. The Air Force version and a carrier-based Navy fighter to be given the all-important task of fleet defense. The principal differences in the two airframes were in the forward fuselage, the landing gear, and the wingtip. The shorter forward fuselage on the Navy version would accommodate a folding radome for carrier deck parking. The station geometry, provision for escape, subsystems, and oxygen system are the same in both cockpits and controls, displays, and instrument systems were made common wherever practical. When the wings were swept back, a near optimum configuration for low drag, high-speed flight was produced. Although the TFX project was mainly the brainchild of General Dynamics, most of the Navy's F-111B was subcontracted to Grumman Aviation. The F-111B, while a multi-role fighter, also had to accommodate the massive Phoenix missile However, because the basic design called for a medium tactical strike aircraft, the overall concept resulted in a plane the Navy considered far too heavy for carrier use. By the time this rare footage of the Navy's version of the TFX was shot, the project had already been abandoned, and the carrier trials were a mere formality. This despite several successful firings of the Phoenix. The principal problem of the F-111B may have been the inability to reduce the aircraft weight below 80,000 pounds. But there were also other problems, including the undercarriage, side-by-side -side crew position, and a general lack of pilot visibility on landing. At no stage was the Navy, with its special needs, optimistic about adopting a fighter, which in every other way was an Air Force bomber. By the late 60s, the Defense Department recognized it had no replacement for the now aging Phantom. Worse still, information was becoming available that Soviet engineers had produced land-based swing-wing fighters with superior performance. The problem was summarized in 1968 by Admiral Thomas F. Connolly. 
there is the ever-present threat from surface to surface or surface to air missiles from either shore stations or missile carrying Soviet ships. The basic problem is that our stable of Navy fighters to meet these threats is rapidly losing its edge. Our F-8 Crusader was started in late 1952, over 15 years ago. It became operational 11 years ago. Our F-4 was a clearly superior fighter when it became operational in 1961. Now the gap is closing. It is a tribute to the skill of the nation's fighter pilots that a high kill ratio has been maintained in Vietnam. We cannot depend on maintaining this margin indefinitely. The time has come to equal the skill of our fighter pilots with a far superior fighter aircraft one that will be superior now and for the next 15 years. With vast experience gained from the F-111B, Grumman had already made moves to produce a suitable defense fighter to fill the void described by Connolly. Grumman experimented with a variety of models and weapons formats to try and produce a concept that could both act as a dogfighter as well as a fleet defense fighter. Their Model 303 clearly filled the requirements. Benefiting from lessons learned in the TFX program, the new aircraft was to rely upon expensive but proven materials such as boron and titanium. The wing box area was doubly strengthened against failure. Two turbofan engines would provide speed and economy, and two separate fins would ensure aircraft stability should one engine fail. The Model 303 was to carry the widest weapon spectrum of any warbird then in service. It carried an M61 cannon for close encounters and dogfighting. The traditional short and medium range Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles. And the long range, deadly accurate Phoenix. The time I was flying the Phantom, uh, that was considered the world's foremost fighter at the time and it had served very well in Vietnam and it was used in a number of uh, other parts of the world and it was like I say about the best all-around fighter aircraft in the world and so it was really a little bit of a letdown almost to go to something like an F-14 that all of a sudden made the Phantom look obsolete and in that regard it would out accelerate the Phantom it would out turn the Phantom uh, it would out-weapon system the Phantom, so everything that we were so proud of our F-4 Phantom for, uh, all of a sudden was left behind in the dust. The concept behind Model 303 would be a lesson to all aircraft builders faced with the problem of having to provide an aircraft that would not only bring them into line with enemy weaponry, but also, because of the cost of development, ensure that a single plane could maintain a competitive edge for years to come. By the 21st of December, 1970, the prototype now referred to as the F-14 and named Tomcat was ready for its maiden flight at Calverton, New York. Test pilots Bob Smythe and Bill Miller had to wait all day for final adjustments. It was only in the late afternoon and with the threat of snow the following day that they finally got aircraft number one into the air. The flight only lasted 10 minutes and was generally uneventful. Both pilots said that the Tomcat behaved well. The next day, the weather turned nasty. It would be nine more days before it was safe to fly the Tomcat again. This time, Miller was to take the front position and Bob Smythe the rear. And the flight was to be anything but uneventful. <laughs> 